Ladies and gentlemen, well, good evening. And you know, you, I, I'm sure, have all uh, felt the presence here of the cathedral. The, it's, it's ancient walls, and I, as a sort of senior Arcadian, have been in here since boyhood and have seen many great occasions. I have seen our queen here come to unveil the stained glass window in the west gable. I have seen the king of Norway, uh, the queen mother, and various other royals. But tonight, a far more important occasion <laughs> is to introduce Jane Goodall. Could I have a big hand, please? Thank you, Ian, and good evening to everyone. Some of you expect that when I begin a talk like this, I'm going to introduce the voice of our closest living relative in the animal planet, the chimpanzee, and I can't wait to give that call in this wonderful space. <laughs> um, some people may feel it's not right to have the presence of an animal in a cathedral, but I gather that uh, there are certain rings on the wall and Cromwell used to put his horses in here. It wasn't necessarily approved. And I've been in several cathedrals around the world where they have on St. Francis Day the blessing of the animals. So I feel it's very appropriate to have the voice of our closest living relative. And this is simply a greeting. It's very particularly uh, relevant to those of you at the back because it's a distance call, yes? and it identifies exactly who the caller is. So... <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I want to begin with a fable, a story that my mother used to tell me and my sister when we were growing up. My sister Judy is somewhere in this space. I have no idea where, but... Anyway, she is. And this was um, a fable about the birds coming together to have a competition. They were arguing as to who could fly the highest. And so they gather, and of course the eagle is sure that he will win, and with these mighty wings he goes higher and higher, and gradually the other birds get tired and start drifting back towards the land. And in the end, even the eagle can fly no higher. But he's up above all the others, just as he knew. Except, hiding in the feathers on his back is a little Jenny Wren. And now she flies up, and she flies highest of all. And the reason I love this fable is because me, it's symbolic of our flight, our progress from birth to grave. And as we fly higher and higher, we can't get very far by ourselves. We all need our ego. As we try to reach a goal that's just a little bit above our grasp. And when I look back over my life and I think of all the amazing people who've helped me on my journey, on my flight, I see them as like the feathers on my eagle, some small, warm ones, some big, strong ones, but every single one playing its part in helping me to travel through the world. And there are some here tonight, my sisters here, Mary Lewis and David Lorraine and John and Nikki Carmichael, and a beautiful introduction from Ian Scott. We're new friends, but I think we're good friends. Um, and Mary Lewis is the one who really brought me to Orkney, but for her, I probably wouldn't be here. She's talked to me and talked to me about this wonderful place where she spent days of her childhood and has been longing to get me here, and here I am. So thank you, Mary. And now I'm sharing with all of you this, this wonderful space. But when I look back over my life at all these people who've helped me, and, and I suppose we should spend a moment thinking, if the people who've helped me are the feathers, what about the eagle itself? And I feel the presence of some great spiritual power very strongly in this cathedral, and for me, that's my eagle. But the one strongest feather that I want to mention, as I always do, 
is my mother because we were blessed to have quite an extraordinary mother. She was, I think, way ahead of her time. And right from the beginning, she supported both of us in whatever it was we wanted to do, imposing discipline. She never smacked us and she never punished us unless we were doing something that we already understood was wrong. And then she punished us by walking around in silence and picking things up and putting them down. It was terrifying. She never <laughs> raised her voice. She didn't need to. So anyhow, when I was 18 months, she came up to my room, apparently, I don't remember this, and found I'd taken a whole handful of earthworms to bed with me. <laughs> well, instead of saying, ugh, throw the dirty things out, she said, Jane, if you leave them here, they'll die. They need the earth. And so uh, together we picked them up and took them back into the garden. And then later on, when I was nearly five, my sister had just been born, and we were having a holiday on my father's family's farm in the country. And uh, we lived in London, so for a little girl loving animals, this was really exciting, meeting all these animals close up. <coughs> And one of my jobs was to help collect hen's eggs. So I was putting the eggs into my basket, no cool battery farms, and you know, you know the size of an egg. And I was apparently asking everybody, but where does the egg come out of the hen? Because I couldn't see a hole in that big. And obviously nobody told me to my satisfaction. So I hid in a hen house and waited and waited and waited. And that was fine, except my family didn't know where I was and they were all searching and it was getting dark, and there's my poor mother, she must have been desperate. Yet, when she saw this excited little girl, instead of punishing me, she sat down to hear the wonderful story of how a hen lays an egg, so that I could close my eyes and see it now as though it was yesterday. She found books for me to read about animals, because my passion had been animals, as it still is today. And when I was, 11 years old, somewhere between 10 and 11. In a second-hand bookshop, I found a little book, I still have it. You know, in those days, we're now going back 70 years, in those days the books were small, the print was small, it was saving on paper, you didn't get this big, lavish, glossy stuff that we get today. And the book was called Tarzan of the Apes. Well, for an animal-loving little girl, you can imagine that she fell deeply, passionately, and romantically in love with Tarzan. And that wretched man went and married the wrong Jane. <laughs> I was very jealous. But that was what began my dream. I was going to grow up, go to Africa, live with animals, and write books about them. Which is, you know, something a young person today, that's nothing unusual. But some of you here will remember, going back um, 60 years or so, that it wasn't the same for girls back then. Girls didn't have that kind of opportunity. It was mostly reserved for boys. They had the adventures. Girls grew up and got married and had children and looked after them. And they might trail along with some man as a missionary's wife or something like that. So people laughed at me and said, Jane, get real, dream about something you can achieve. Because on top of the fact that I was just a mere girl, Africa was a far away dark continent. And, as I've said, we didn't have any money, so how would I get there? But whereas other people told me to dream about something I could achieve, my mother said, if you really want something and you work hard and you never give up, you will find a way. So that was the kind of support that she gave me and my sister who went on to do music. And it was just so, it's, it's so lucky if you're born into a family and you have a parent like that. That's just the luck of the game. I don't suppose I had a choice as to what family I'd be born into, but I just drew uh, a lucky, you know, it's a lucky turn of the dice. I had my mother. So, still with this passion of going to Africa, but I couldn't get to university. All my friends, I think just about all of them, went on from high school to university, but we did not have the money. And back then, to get a scholarship, you had to qualify in a foreign language, and I've never been able to really learn a foreign language. So again, it was my mother who said, we'll do a secretarial course, and then perhaps you can get a job in Africa. And eventually that's what happened. 
A school friend invited me out. I went home and worked as a waitress for months until I had enough money for a return fare. And back then it was boats. There weren't planes going back and forth. It was a boat. It was the old Kenya castle. And what a magical, magical journey that was. For one thing, we bought the cheapest ticket, which was through the Suez Canal. That was the time of the war with Egypt, and the Suez Canal was closed. So I had to work a few more weeks to get a bit more money to go all the way around the Cape. And what, it was three weeks at sea, slightly over three weeks at sea. And you know, today we go off in a plane, but when you're going in a boat like that, you have time to adjust, you get the different kind of climate, the different smells you put in to foreign ports. It was just so exciting. As well, of course, I had enormous fun on the boat. I was a young girl, and there were lots of um, handsome young men, I suppose, and I had a great time. Uh, finally, arriving in Kenya, stayed with my friend, heard about the late Louis Leakey. Some of you may know of him. He spent his life searching for the fossilized remains of, of early man, uh, mostly in Africa. And he also knew a lot about African animals. And somebody told me if I was interested in animals, I should meet him. So I went to the Natural History Museum. He was curator. And I can remember him taking me around and asking me so many questions. And because I had followed my mother's advice and I'd gone on reading about Africa, reading about African animals, spending hours in the Natural History Museum in London, in my lunch hours when I worked there as a secretary, I could answer many of his questions. And so he offered me a job as his secretary. You see, my mother hit it again. She suggested this might happen, and it did. But it wasn't long before he apparently decided that I was the person he'd be looking for, for he says 10 years, to go and try and find out about the behavior of our closest living relative. Lewis had no idea how close chimpanzees and humans were back then. Nobody did. We didn't know all these details about the biology. We didn't realize that the DNA of humans and chimps differs in structure by only just over 1%. We didn't know that the chimpanzee's blood and immune system was so like ours. It can catch all our infectious diseases. And we didn't know the extent to which the human and chimpanzee brain had a similar anatomy. But nevertheless, it appeared even then that chimps were very like us. And Louis Leakey sent me out to study chimps and then Diane Fossey to do gorillas and the Ruti Galdikas to do orangutans because he believed, as I think the majority of biologists that I know and evolutionists believe, that about six or seven million years ago there was an ape-like, human-like creature on the planet and that that was a common ancestor. And so he believed that if there was behavior shared by humans today and chimpanzees today, that that behavior, that common behavior, may have been six, seven million years ago present in the common ancestor, and that therefore the, uh, these traits would have come up through the chimpanzee evolutionary climb and the human evolutionary climb, and therefore <coughs> would have been present in the uh, Stone Age men and women <coughs> whose remains he was digging up. That's what he believed. And in fact, if you read books about evolution today, you very often find reference to the chimpanzee as the model for the behavior of early man. So it wasn't that easy for this expedition to get off the ground. Of course, I was all keen and eager. But first of all, money had to be found. Who was going to give money to this young girl with no university degree? What a crazy idea. She didn't know Africa either. But in the end, a wealthy American businessman said to Lewis, all right, money for six months. We'll see how she does. Fine, ready to go. Oh, now the British authorities in what was then the British protectorate of Tanganyika, it wasn't independent then, 
and the authorities refused to take responsibility for this young girl. But in the end, because Lewis pestered and pestered and pestered, they said, oh, all right, but she has to have a companion. And who volunteered that same amazing mother? So you can begin to see the kind of role that she's played in my life. When I first got to Gombe, there I am, my dream is coming true, the forest is beautiful, it's on the edge of this glorious, deep, uh, pure lake, Lake Tanganyika, the longest freshwater lake in the world, and the second deepest. And the biggest problem was that chimpanzees are conservative. They had not seen a white ape before. They took one look at me and vanished. <laughs> and although you know, being out in the forest every day was magical. But all the time I knew that if I didn't see something exciting before the money ran out, that that would have been letting Lewis Leakey down, be the end of the study. So I was getting increasingly frustrated and worried. And there was my mother to keep telling me all the things I was learning. Like chimps make sleeping platforms or nests at night. They travel around in small groups and sometimes gather when there's a delicious crop of figs or something down in a valley. And I saw that the small groups were sometimes a group of males, sometimes a mother with what seemed like dependent young. And I was learning, of course, about the foods they eat. So she would be sort of boosting my morale when I got down in the evening. And it was really sad that she had to leave before the breakthrough observation, the one that now is taken for granted, that chimpanzees in the wild can not only use objects as tools, but make tools, simple and primitive, nevertheless modifying a natural object to make it suitable for a particular purpose. And it was a cold, wet day and I was a bit depressed. Mama had just gone. There was nobody for me much to talk to. There was an African cook, but I couldn't, I couldn't really discuss the excitements of the day because he didn't really understand why I was so excited or depressed or whatever. And a wonderful boatman. But, you know, there they were. They were wonderful people. But it wasn't like having my mother there. And it was wet and it was cold. And there were only six weeks left of the study. And then I saw, I saw this one chimpanzee who had begun to lose his fear of me, whom I have named David Graybeard. And he was picking pieces of straw and using them as tools to fish for termites. And he was picking leafy twigs and removing the leaves, which was modifying that twig so that he could use that as a tool to fish for termites. And when I sent a telegram to Lewis Leakey, not straight away, I had to see it several times because it seemed almost too good to be true. Um, Lewis was extremely excited. Back then, it was thought that humans and only humans used and made tools, and we were defined as man the tool maker. And so Lewis sent this telegram back saying, now we have to redefine man, redefine tool, or accept chimpanzees as humans. It was that observation that enabled him to approach the National Geographic Society. It was because of the tool using and the very crude pictures I, I managed to get that they agreed to put money into this expedition. And my sister Judy came out for a short time to take, to take some of the very first photos uh, that were published in the magazine of tool using. And from there on, it sort of got better and better and better, and that was partly because of David Graybeard. You know, every chimpanzee, like every human, has his or her own distinct personality. And for some reason, David was calmer than the others, and I would approach a group where David was, and the others would be all ready to run, and then they'd look from David to me, because he just sat there calmly. And I think in the end, they decided that I couldn't really be so frightening and they began to let me 